Well, so good to see y'all. I tell you, one of my favorite pictures of brotherhood and friendship is what you find in J.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings between Samwise Gamgee, who is the gardener for his good buddy Frodo Baggins. Now, they are hobbits, and they live in this wonderful place called the Shire, which is just filled with all kinds of, 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 of wonderful things, and it's just a great place to be until this growing darkness overtakes them, and it becomes very evident that Frodo has a purpose to play, that he's going to have to go and destroy the ring that was created to give the power, be powerful above all the other rings, and has to go to that place of Mordor and throw that ring back into the fire from which it came. And on his way there, he, he's going to need the support and the help of, of a fellowship. And the closest member of that fellowship was his good friend, Samwise Gamgee, who was completely committed to his buddy Frodo. And as you read of their journey together, as you read of their adventure, their friendship only deepens. And it becomes very evident that while they liked each other at the very beginning, they always had a fondness for each other. Their friendship really took off as they went on that journey together, facing all the travail and the challenges that they would face. And that was the, the crucible in which their friendship really thrived and really grew deeply. And when I think of that, it reminds me that real friendship, real brotherhood, always has to be moving towards something in the same direction. That if Frodo and Samwise had stayed in the comfort and the security of the Shire, they never would have found the level of friendship that they eventually found and enjoyed so deeply and so fully. But when they were on that journey together, going in the same direction, pursuing the same goal, that is when their friendship really was cemented. And what we see there is really a picture of what I think the Lord has given us in brotherhood in sisterhood within the body of Christ. Can I just tell you that if your relationships with someone, you might like them okay, you might enjoy spending time with them. In fact, they may even be your favorite traveling buddy to get on a place and go somewhere together and have the same common experience. But if you're not journeying together toward the ultimate higher call of what Christ is doing as you're journeying together to be faithful to him on mission for him, your friendship will never get as deep and as full as it ought to be. That The fullness of fellowship and the fullness of brotherhood happens when two believers are joining together, linking hearts together to be on mission to do what it is that God is calling them to do, to declare the gospel to the ends of the world. Now, I share that with you to get your head in the right space to receive what we're going to find in John chapter 13 starting in verse 21. Now, Adam did an awesome job preaching verses 1 through 20. All of this text happens around the Passover meal, and the opening 20 verses describe what happens when Jesus does the unthinkable. He takes the role from the servant in the room, takes on that role himself, and he washes his disciples' feet. And in that act, and in that picture, what we have is really a beautiful picture of a new birth, of the new birth for every person who've come to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Remember what Peter protests, Lord, if you're going to wash my feet, don't just stop there, watch all of me. And Jesus says, you've already been bathed. I don't have any reason to wash all of you. And all of that is, that is a picture of what happens when we come to know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. We are cleansed. The way that we sing about it in that song, Victory in Jesus, is that we are plunged to victory beneath his cleansing flood. And after you have trusted in Jesus, you are cleansed, you are made right, you experience a new birth, you pass from death to life, you're never the same, and that status never changes. But while that is true, and while it's true that we receive the fullness of the righteousness of Christ in our identity. Isn't it also true that there's a lot of dusty roads that we travel that make our feet dirty, that require that to be cleansed? 
And that is why that picture of a believer who is trusted in Jesus but has dirty feet that needs to be cleansed is a beautiful picture of what it means to be on a journey with the Lord because there's going to be plenty of times that our feet get dusty. It's a picture of sin. We still fall into it. We have to confess that sin. We have to go to the Lord daily. And what this picture is, as Jesus washes the disciples' feet, is something that he invites every believer to do every single day. As we go to him in prayer, as we go to his word, we put our feet in the hands of Christ as we confess our sin and we repent of our sin daily. And we need to do that every single day. Well, that is what the first part of verse 20 of chapter 13, verses 1 through 20 is about. But then we come, beginning in verse 21, to a part of the chapter that I really believe speaks about the need for the body of Christ, the need for us to experience true Christian brotherhood and sisterhood with one another. Won't you read about it with me? In John 13, beginning in verse 31, or 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in the spirit, and he testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. And one of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter mentioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, what are you going to do? Do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, go buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. It was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. God is glorified in him. God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while, I am with you. And you will seek me, just as I said to the Jews, So now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Well, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord... Why can I not follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. When I think about this section of John 13, as we have moved away from the book of signs in John 1 through 11, now we're in the book of Jesus is glory. What I want you to consider when you think about these verses is this. That brotherhood is a non-negotiable necessity for a true believer of Jesus. And I'm not trying to leave the ladies out. I can only fit so much on the slide at once. But whether you're looking at it, brotherhood and sisterhood, we need the family of God and we need to be connected to the family of God. It is a non-negotiable necessity for us as believers in Jesus, how much we deeply need each other. And so when you think about this, I want you to know there is a theme that John introduces in John chapter 12 that he's also reintroducing in John chapter 13. In John chapter 12, verse 16, he says that his disciples did not understand the things he was teaching them at first. But when Jesus was glorified, after his resurrection, after his ascension, that is when they would remember, and that is when they understood. We see that same theme of the disciples not fully understanding what's happening as they're walking through it and experiencing it 
in John chapter 13, verse 7. What I am doing, Jesus says, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Well, until the disciples see the resurrected Jesus, until they see him ascend into heaven, there's things in chapters 13 through 19 that they're going to have to wait to understand later. And I believe this is very much the case in how they even understood their relationship with one of their 12 disciples, Judas Iscariot. See, he is the betrayer. He is the one who fulfills what is written in Psalm 41, verse 9. Jesus tells us earlier in chapter 13 that he's the fulfillment of that text. The time that Ahithophel, who is a trusted counselor to David, betrayed him and chose instead to back David's wayward son Absalom. And how Judas is one who, just like Ahithophel, lifted his heel against Jesus, just like Ahithophel lifted his heel against David, and just like Ahithophel's guilt would lead to his ultimate suicide, so it would be the same for Judas as he would take his own life for having betrayed Jesus. There's a reason why whenever you read about the lists of the disciples in the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, that The apostle Peter is always listed first, and Judas Iscariot is always listed last. But the reason for all of this is something the disciples are going to have to understand later. At this point in the story, the only two people in the room that are clued in as to what is about to come is Jesus, who is the ultimate master who is the sovereign over all things and has the foreknowledge to know what Judas is about to do. And it is Judas, the master concealer himself. They're the only two. So when Jesus addresses his disciples at the beginning of the text that I just read in verse 21, we read that he is troubled yet again. It's the same word, if you'll recall, from chapter 11 that's used to describe Jesus' reaction to his friend Lazarus' death as he goes to Lazarus's tomb is the same word that's used of the emotion that was stirred in him in chapter 12 when he is thinking about the coming dread of the cross. So when we read in chapter 13 of him being troubled, it means that his soul is in a state of convulsion. And the reason for it, as he makes clear in verse 21, is that there is a traitor in the room. And when he tells the brotherhood of the disciples what is about to happen, that one who is among them is going to betray him, the disciples, they're confused. They just look at each other. It's as if they don't even know what to say. And what comes next is what I find to be surprising. Because as they are together around the table, reclining and relaxing in a position of true friendship, It is Peter who motions to John, whose head happens to be situated, relaxed on the womb of uh, uh, Jesus, just uh, on Jesus himself, right on his stomach. He leans in and he asks John, hey, can you ask Jesus who it is? And when John then asks Jesus, who is Will it be? Jesus answers John in a hushed tone that I don't even think Peter could make out. It is the one to whom I will give this morsel of dipped bread. Now, when he said that, he gave the morsel of dipped bread, which is a picture of ultimate friendship to Judas. And that signaled only to John the identification of the betrayer. And when Judas received that morsel, acting as if he was a friend of the one who gave it to him, that is when the text says that Satan entered into him. And do you want to know what I find to be the most stunning truth of this text? Is that Judas could be any one of us. He was as accomplished of a hypocrite as anyone could be. 
Scholars have suggested that of all the disciples, he was the man who was of the highest social standing. He was the one who actually had true education. Harry Ironside, that wonderful preacher, used to preach of Jesus of of Judas's class, and he stated that Judas was the real gentleman of all the teachers. So his external presentation was flawless. Judas was the one in any public gathering that always knew when to sit, when to rise, how to talk the language of the society's power brokers. No one would have even thought that Judas was capable of being a traitor especially all the other disciples, save for John. And when Jesus tells Judas to go and do what he's going to do and to do it quickly, according to verse 28, the other disciples have no clue what is taking place. And Jesus, and Judas rather, leaves them and goes out into the dark. And the other 11 disciples don't suspect a thing. And I find that sobering. After all of that time they spent together, how could they not know? How could they have never picked up what was truly on the inside of Judas? But then I see how that's played out in everyday life. And maybe it's not as surprising as we might expect it to be. When I pastored in Louisville, Kentucky, my first church for about 11 years, I was struck when I realized that of all the churches of significance in about a 10-mile radius of my church, every one of those churches had undergone a moral failing of a pastor in their pulpit within about the decade before I had gotten there. And the most significant of those churches was one that I had come from before I landed at this church. And when I learned of the story of what happened, when after years he had been caught in an affair and the whole time that particular pastor would show up at a restaurant with his accountability partners every single week acting as if everything was on the up and up. You then begin to see how easy it is for all of us to see how we can fall into the situation that Judas found himself in. When I think about that, it just beckons for us to be a people who are truly holding each other to a place of brotherhood and sisterhood that we're not afraid to ask the hard questions, not just to meet and give generalizations, is everything okay, but to ask questions that really get to the heart of how we're doing in our relationship with the Lord. Questions such as these, have you placed your feet in the hands of Jesus each day, spending time with him and work and studying his word and in prayer? Or have you shared the gospel or your testimony with an unbeliever this week? Or have you prioritized your wife and your children this week? Have you viewed anything immoral this week? Have you had any lustful thoughts that you have been tempted to act upon this week? I was reminded as I taught our group in our marriage class that I just finished teaching the words of Martin Luther. You can't stop the birds from flying over the head, but you can stop them from nesting in your head. It's not the thoughts, but it's what you do with those thoughts and acting on those thoughts. Have you done anything with them in the following in the week? Have you told any lies or half-truth that put yourself in a good light in relationship to others? Have you participated in anything unethical this week? And then the last question that ties it all together, have you lied about any of the answers that you've just given me? This is what real brotherhood and sisterhood looks like. Sharing life together at this level Pursuing Christ with all of our hearts in both mission and in our purity as we try to live lives of holiness. We need true soul-disclosing brotherhood because all of us have more of Judas in us than we might even realize that we have. We need to enter into true brotherhood because God will use it to protect us from betrayal. But That's not the only thing true brotherhood does for us. Another joy that it will bring into our lives is that it proclaims the lordship of Jesus. And that's the next thing that I want you to see in this text. It's only natural that if you happen to be a fly on the wall or 
were in the room when Jesus was having this time with his disciples, that when Judas left out into the night at his departure, the mood in the room shifted. Don't miss what has happened here for Judas so far. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he washed Judas's feet too. When Jesus offered all of them a wine-soaked morsel, an expression of true friendship at the communion table, Judas deceptively accepted it. And all the while, Jesus knew he was the one who would betray him. But despite Judas seeing Jesus' power, his perfection, his unyielding love, he leaves out into a night that, as you know, the rest of the story will never have a morning for him. And in the same way that we are free to talk when someone who does not like us finally leaves the room, the atmosphere changes for the better after Judas leaves. And Jesus now talks to his disciples in a bit of a different way. And he explains to them that the time of his glory is at hand. So now we're going to see from this point forward the book of the glory of Jesus. Jesus explains in this very text right here that he is going to die. But he doesn't speak of it in that kind of language. He speaks of it in the language of the glory of God. Because the disciples need to know how his coming death that is going to happen in just a few days, how it's going to fit within the greater context of God's ultimate redemptive and eternal plan. They're going to need to know that none of this was by accident. That all of it fits within the grand scheme of what God has in mind. Where does it fit within the context? When I really think about how to understand the glory of Christ in these verses, I appreciate the way that Matt Carter and John Redberg explained it in their commentary on the Gospel of John. And this is what they say. If your child were to walk into the kitchen and they saw mom or dad, is oftentimes on Friday night, it's dessert night, and I'm doing the cooking. And they see me with a mixing bowl with a wooden spoon in my hand, and I'm mixing whatever is together in that spoon. Now, if it's Allie, it's something homemade. If it's me, it's something out of a box, right? But if they see me mixing it, and they ask me, Daddy, what are you doing? It really wouldn't help them a whole lot for me to look at them and say, well, I am taking this wooden spoon, and I'm turning it around over and over again in the bowl. What good would that do? That's not the way I would answer. If they ask me, Daddy, what are you doing? I'm going to take the advantage to give them a lot of excitement about what's coming. I'm going to say, sweetie, I'm baking cookies, right? I'm putting it in the context of which the action is taking place. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us in John chapter 13, when he talks about the glory of Christ, he uses that language to put his coming death within the context of all of that glory. So 23 times in the book of John, we'll find a form of the word glory. Five of those times we find right here in our text in verses 31 and 32. That is a word that means honor. It means supreme reputation. It's also a visible expression of Jesus' ultimate excellence because it is the ultimate reason for us to describe honor and glory and worship. It is the supreme moment, as D.A. Carson says, of God's divine disclosure because in the cross is where we see the fullest expression of God's holiness, his love, his righteousness, his mercy, his justice, his sovereignty, his grace, his humility, his wisdom, his love, it's all there in one glorious scripture fulfilling salvation granting act of sacrificial obedience and love. It's the cross. That's the glory of Christ. And because he's going to the cross as the perfect lamb of God, he's doing so to glorify the Father and through his resurrection the Father will in turn glorify the Son. So everything about Christianity is about a bloody cross. It is, as Matt Carter goes on to write, I love this. This will be something you'll remember this week. Something that he wrote. I wish I would have thought it. 
The cross is the grand central station of the gospel in which every part of life runs out of it. So when Jesus departs to go to a cross and die, he tells his disciples he's leaving them alone. He's not leaving them alone, rather. He's leaving them, not alone, but with one another. And that their love for one another will be more important than it had ever been before. And this is the new, in the new commandment that Jesus says that he leaves with them. This new commandment is sourced in Christ. This new commandment is given a standard in Christ. Even while we were the enemies of God, at enmity with him, as it says in the book of Romans, Christ died for us. It is a love that even encompasses the enemies that we would have. It reaches out to those enemies. And it is new because after his ascension, it's going to bring in a new brotherhood and sisterhood, a new community, which is the church filled with his Holy Spirit, which will then come into existence. So here's the new commandment, that you love one another with a love that is sourced in Christ, that standard is Christ, that bursts the church, which is the body of Christ, and this love is to be the badge that we wear as disciples of Jesus. Our love is what's going to identify us as followers of Jesus. So when we have an absence of love, what does that say? And that love here is so unique, and it is so beautiful, and it is so fragrant that it even gives evidence to someone who is lost and dying in their sin, that everything that we tell them about Jesus is, in fact, true. When they see the love of Christ in us, this new commandment being lived out, they will see something that the world knows not of that you cannot find anywhere else. You want to know what our church needs to be effective in reaching Smyrna? We just got to do the new commandment. We just got to love people in the source of Christ, in the standard of Christ, bringing them into the community, the body of Christ in a way that is so refreshing and beautiful. There's nothing in the world that even compares to it. This new commandment I leave you, that you love one another. Well, Judas is not the only one who's going to have a horrible night. text ends by talking about Peter's night. And Peter's going to fall even before the evening is over. Now, Peter's fall is going to be different from Judas. There's good reason why Peter is listed first in all the listing of the disciples. He's brave, both action, he's always willing to walk on the water. He's brave in speech. Who do people say? You're the Christ. But boy, he also blows it a lot of times, doesn't he? But boy, is he brave, and he loves Jesus so much. But this is going to be a hard night for him. It's going to be a night that he's not going to recover from for quite some while. Because his main weakness is going to have to be exposed. And all of his love for Jesus, and all of his bravery... He is terribly self-reliant. He overestimates his own strength and his own abilities. He's obviously not ever applied the truth of Proverbs 16, 18, that pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And that pride in his life is a spiritual cancer that's got to be taken out of him. And the only one who can is the true surgeon for his soul, which is Christ. So Peter one day will do what he intends to do, give his life for Jesus. But that day hasn't come because he's not prepared for that. He's not matured to that point yet. Jesus tells him, Peter, you're not even going to make it through the night before you deny me three times in the rooster crows. And after the night is an empty truth in this text. It's going to take Peter a little time to recover from this surgery. 
Don't just get over it. It takes a while. Not even Ronald Acuna can have his knee worked on and not come back the same season, right? All of us in this room, and we have to go through times that something is taken out of us. There's a time that we've got to lay down and rest and give time to heal. There's a time that things get discouraging and they get dark. And the darkness has to come while the healing takes place before we can rise up and be restored again. But when we go through that time, you know how important it is that we lean on one another. Can I tell you how many times I've had someone come to me and say, Pastor, if not for my church family, I don't know how I would have made it through. You see, this is where brotherhood and sisterhood comes in. It protects us from betrayal. It proclaims the lordship of Jesus to a lost and dying world. And finally, it restores us when we fall. So as we come to the end of chapter 13, my hope in this sermon has been to somehow show you how important brotherhood and sisterhood is. In a time that we have been fed this belief that we need to be alone together, which has been one of the hardest things in this pandemic, which is straight out of the, the pit. When you're by yourself and you're alone and you're isolated and your world is an echo chamber of your own beliefs, you're not being stirred up to love and good works, as Hebrews says, is the reason we shouldn't forsake the assembling together. You're being stirred up to other things, and it ain't good. We need the brotherhood and sisterhood of the church. And I hope your understanding of how to think of that through John 13, I hope this has helped you consider the importance of that in your life. I hope you'll go home and just take an inventory, just examine where is my commitment to the body of Christ how is it a priority in my life right now? Are there some adjustments that our family needs to make? I'm about to start meddling. I have four daughters, right? I have one who is an incredible gymnast and one who loves to dance. And when they hit that place, the gymnastics said, we want you to be on the traveling team. And we said, well, what's it going to require? Well, you got to be here every Sunday. It became very obvious to us that our daughter is not meant to be a competing gymnast. And when it came time for the dance team to say, we want her to be on that, but you got to come on Sundays, well, there's another way for her to enjoy dancing that will require something different. Are we going to be a people that prioritize the people of God, the body of God, Christ, we need each other. We've got to be together. We're not better alone. We're always worse for it. And my hope in this sermon is that it'll show you the body of Christ protects you from betrayal and allows you to live in the fullness of the new command of loving one another. It restores us when we fall. We need each other in those times. But I've not truly fulfilled my objective here today. If I've failed... And I only show you how much you need the church, but how much you need Christ. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And Ryan's going to come and it's going to lead us in a word of invitation. And I just invite you right now. I can't talk about the body of Christ without talking about its head, which is Jesus. And boy, there's nothing better to talk about than him. He came and he lived. He died and was raised from the dead. And if you'll confess him with your mouth and believe him, Christ raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. All who call upon his name will be saved. You'll find purpose. You'll find joy. You'll find the truest version of yourself as you're in right relationship with your creator who remakes you into the person that he wants you to be. All within relationship with Jesus. Don't you need him? Have you ever come to the place that you've realized what is, that your only hope to deal with your sin is repent and believe in Christ. And he's the one that forgives us. He cleanses us. He makes us new. He gives us life. And if you need him, maybe for the very first time, won't you just come forward and we can talk about what it means to know Jesus. For the rest of us here, what a season we've been through. 
We need the body more than ever before. It protects us from betrayal. It helps us love one another well. It's in the body of Christ that we're restored when we fall. And if Peter falls, all of us are going to fall. We need each other deeply. Look at where you are in relationship to the body of Christ. If you're here today and you know that this is where God's calling you to join with, we hope that you'll become a part of this family right here. We're going to sing. If you want to come and talk about your intention, we can talk about what it means to take steps toward church membership. We're just going to have this time for you to respond to the message. And I just invite you to come forward. Father, we give this time to you. We ask you to have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray.